Okay, well, thank you to all the organizers, especially uh, Nam, for organizing this nice event. And thank you to all the students for being here. I hope you have a, a nice uh, week, a nice, nice few days around belief functions. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give this talk uh, on this topic, which has been a topic of interest of mine since my uh, PhD. Uh, so is it working this stuff? Yeah. So the problem that we talk about is that of uh, the following. So suppose we have pieces of evidence represented by belief functions. So here we have n belief functions. So in the sense of Schaffer about the actual unknown value of a variable x defined on the domain omega. And uh, so what we'd like to do is to somehow combine this, uh, these belief functions into a single one representing what we know about the variable x, okay? So that is, we would like some function f that takes as inputs uh, these uh, n belief functions uh, and produces as output a single belief function f. Okay. So the original proposal by Schaffer for this uh, function f is Demsel's rule of combination. So this rule has had a lot of success and is still uh, arguably the most often uh, encountered rule in um, theoretical developments and in applications. However, its applicability is tied to some particular requirements. And so since this proposal, uh, alternative combination rules have appeared to uh, handle a variety of situations, leading to what uh, Philip Smith called uh, a jungle of combination rules. So the aim of this lecture is uh, threefold. First, I would like to do a review of Debs' rule, and in particular, when using this rule is appropriate, uh, well, as well as, as some of its properties. Then I will uh, not review all the possible combination rules. I will do a, a guided or selected tour of the jungle. And uh, so I will cover the most frequent and uh, sound alternative to them, so rule. And finally, I will uh, touch upon the issue of how to select a particular rule for a given problem. So uh, my talk will be, will be divided in three parts accordingly. So first around them, so rule, then some of its alternatives, and then the issue of uh, rule selection. And since I'm going to talk about belief function combination, I need to recall a few things about belief functions. So fortunately, Thierry did uh, the talk this morning, so I can be brief, okay? But I still need to, to, to cover a few things just to fix the notations at least and uh, introduce a few ideas. So, so this you have seen this morning already. So in Schaeffer's theory, a piece of evidence about the variable x taking values in a finite set omega called the frame of discernment is typically represented by a mass function, okay, which is a mapping from the power set of omega to the unit interval, such that the sum of the mass given to the non-empty sets of omega, non-empty subsets of omega equals one. So uh, we call every uh, subset of omega that receives a positive mass a focal element, or Prakash, uh, so a uh, focal set. And I will denote by f of m the set of focal sets of focal elements of m. And so, as we have seen, there exist equivalent representations uh, of a mass function. So, in particular, the belief function. Uh, so, we assign the degree of belief. The degree of belief of a is the sum of the masses given to the subsets of a. We have the plausibility function, which allocates to the subset a the, the sum of the masses given to the non to the subsets that have a non uh, empty intersection with a. Okay. So here is an example of a mass function, so taken from a true story. So all of, all of those that have MacBooks around the, in the, the room, perhaps you will recognize this problem. So my Apple MacBook has broken down, and because X of the issue is either a power problem, a CPU malfunction, an hard drive failure, or a corrupted OS, okay? So the frame of discernment here is P for a power problem, C for CPU malfunction, etc. so H and O. And then I have a technician that conducts uh, an investigation and finds that the cause of the issue is either uh, a power problem or a CPU malfunction, okay? So if the investigation was conducted properly, uh, so it's valid, we know that the cause of the issue is either a power problem or a CPU malfunction. And if the investigation is not valid, we just know nothing basically, so just X belongs to omega. So suppose there is a chance, point, point one, that the investigation was not conducted properly, so this means that is with probability uh, 0.9, no, the probability of knowing that the issue is uh, P or C is uh, 0.9, and the probability of knowing nothing is uh, 0.1, okay? 
So this piece of evidence here that uh, was most of the problem can be modeled by this mass function at the bottom here. So we allocate 0 0.9 to the subset PC and 0 0.1 to the whole frame. Okay. So again, this was the recall this morning, but it's important in my talk. So, so this is the in the previous slide we saw uh, we gave the meaning to a particular mass function. Okay. Here is the semantics that Schaeffer gave uh, in general to, to mass functions. So in, in Schaeffer's survey, the mass functions are obtained by fitting evidence to canonical examples of this form here. So suppose we receive a coded message uh, containing some information about the variable x dependent on omega. And more precisely, the actual code we use is unknown, but we know that it was one of C1 to Cn, that each code had the chance pi of being selected. Okay? And furthermore, we know that the meaning of the message is x belongs to some subset AI if the code CI was used. So then what do we know about X? So for any A, the total chance of the message being X belongs to A is the sum of the PIs for all I's such that AI equals A, okay? For it is that the message implies, implies X belongs to A is better A and that it is consistent with X uh, uh, in A is the possibility of A. So there are some important uh, particular cases of mass functions. So Thierry already mentions the, the first three ones here. So the logical mass function corresponds to a, to a set. So there is a single Fokker set. Total ignorance is modeled by the vacuous mass function. So in this talk, it's uh, noted M omega. It was M uh, with a question mark in Thierry's talk. And if all the Fokker sets are singleton, then uh, the mass function is said to be Bayesian. Okay? So in this case, it corresponds to probability distribution. And one that is important in my talk is uh, what, what we call is a mass function that is simple. So we said the mass function is simple if it has two focal sets. So omega and some other strict subsets A of omega. So in this case, it means that the, the mass function has the following form. So some probability WA is allocated to omega and one minus WA is allocated to A. And it may be convenient to denote such uh, so-called simple mass functions uh, using this notation here, so we have the subset A and then this probability WA, which is allocated to the, to the whole frame. Okay? So for instance, in my uh, example that I had before, it was actually a simple mass function. And we could uh, have written it in this way here, so subset PC and the probability 0 0.1. So I recall this was, so it is this mass function here. And so as we have just seen, mass functions are generalized uh, sets, okay? So in terms of informative contents, it's very easy to compare sets. In particular, so if I have two pieces of information, X belongs to A and X belongs to B, then we see that X belongs to A is more informative than X belongs to B if A is included in B. And so this ordering between sets can be extended to mass functions uh, using the specialization ordering. So it reads as follows, given two mass functions, M1 and M2, M1 is at least as informative as M2, which we will denote like this, if N1 can be obtained from M2 by distributing each mass M2 of B to the subsets of B. Okay, so Thierry already mentioned this ordering this morning. So I will use it quite a bit in this talk. So it has some important properties. It extends set inclusion. Okay, it has the vacuous mass function as greatest element. And also if M1 is more informative than M2 in the sense of this specialization ordering, then we have that the plausibility function associated to uh, M1 will be lower than that of uh, uh, M2. Okay, so we can now turn our attention to Dempster's rule, and I will start by recalling how it can be derived using uh, Schaeffer's randomly coded message semantics. So suppose the following uh, situation, let M1 and M2 be two mass function induced by two randomly coded messages, which I may also call sources. So with C1 to Cn, P1 to Pn, and A1 to An, the codes, their chances, and their associated message meanings in the case of the first mass function, the first message, and C prime one to C prime M, P prime one to P prime M, and B1 to Bm, the codes, their chances, and their uh, message meanings in the case of the second message. So assume the, the message messages are independent. So that is, we suppose that the two random choices of codes were, um, are independent, which means that there is a chance pi p prime j that the pair c prime uh, c i c prime j of codes uh, was chosen. Okay. Assume further that the messages are reliable, which means that if the actual codes were c i and c prime j, we can conclude that x belongs to the intersection of a i and b j, for sure. So here we can remark that. In the decoding of this 
encoded messages may tell us some, something. So if AI intersection BJ is equal to the empty set, then we know that this pair here, C I C prime J, could not be the pair of codes actually used. Okay? So we must condition the chance distributions on the codes to eliminate all those pairs, which means that we must condition the, the chance distributions on the code that do not lead uh, to a contradiction, which is this event. So if we make these two assumptions here, the messages are independent and reliable, then we have that the probability of the overall message being x belongs to C is equal to k times the sum of the product P i P prime J for all i and j's, such that the intersection of AI and BJ equals C. And this is actually nothing but uh, k, uh, k uh, times the sum of the product M1A and M2B for all A and B, such that the intersection equals to C. And here, this normalization factor, k, k here, is the inverse of 1 minus kappa, where kappa is a degree of conflict, which is defined as a probability to obtain a contradiction. So this reasoning here leads to uh, Damso's rule of combination combining mass function uh, induced by uh, random, uh, by uh, independent and reliable uh, messages. So this rule, uh, the, the combination of M1 and M2 by this rule will be noted M1 plus M2, like this. And we call it the orthogonal sum, and it's defined as the mass function that is described here on this slide. And it is defined only if the, the degree of conflict is lower than, than one. So here is an example. So the, on the first point here, you see the mass function that we had uh, before. So the technician analysis, we can represent it by this simple mass function here. You see uh, this simple mass function. So this will be M1. Now assume that a friend returns this mass function about the cause of the of why the MacBook has broken down. Okay. So if we assume these two pieces of evidence to be independent and reliable, and this means that uh, the, the, the subset CH intersection PC equals C will receive the mass 0 0.8 times 0 0.9 equals 0 0.72, which you see here. And so we must do that for all the focal sets of M, M1 and M2. And this will give us this mass function here, which is the orthogonal sum of M1 and M2. Okay, so this was uh, the, the derivation of Demso's rule using um, Schaeffer's randomly coded message semantics. But there exist other justifications for this rule. And uh, here in particular, I'm giving one such justification that was provided in, in the context of the transferable belief model, which was mentioned this morning. So there exist other justifications for this rule. And at the end of the talk, you will see uh, I, I put some references on this topic. So uh, an important difference between the transferable belief model and the uh, and Schaeffer's evidence theory is that in the CBM, uh, it is allowed to put some mass and positive mass on the empty set, which is interpreted as the probability that the actual value of the variable does not belong to the frame. It's called the, the open world assumption. So the justification in the, of, uh, in the transferable belief model goes as follows. So let O dot be a combination rule for two mass functions. And assume this rule must satisfy the following requirements. So the combination of M1 and M2 by the rule should be more informative than both M1 and M2. Uh, the combination rule should be commutative and associative. And the last so requirement is that if you combine some mass function M with um, a logical mass function focused on A, the result should be the least informative among the more informative mass functions M prime than M, such that uh, the complement of A yeah, is not plausible. So if we uh, want a rule that satisfies all these requirements, we can show that uh, the rule should be this rule here, which is the so-called conductive rule or unnormalized Dempster's rule, which is the same as Dempster's rule, except that, um, so Dempster's rule uh, is equal to this rule, except that we need to divide by Y minus kappa here, so which is nothing but one minus the degree, uh, the class given to the empty set by, by the conjunctive rule. Yeah, hence the name, so this rule is the unnormalized version of them. Okay, so uh, Demsos rule has some nice properties. So it is commutative and associative, which means basically that the order of combination does not matter. It is insensitive to vacuous situation. That's the vacuous must function as natural elements. And as Thierry mentioned this morning also, generalizes uh, set intersection and probabilistic conditioning. 
which can be quickly seen as uh, really functional generalized sets and probabilities. Also, so um, as we saw this morning, there is an equivalent representation of a mass function, which is the commonality function, which is defined like this. So the commonality of A is the sum of the mass given to the supersets of A. This is the uh, equation that allows us to recover M from Q. And so this, we have a nice property for, with respect to this function, which is that the commonality function associated to the conjunctive combination of two mass functions M1 and M2 is equal to the pointwise product of the communities, community functions associated to M1 and M2. And moreover, the, the commonality function associated to the orthogonal sum is proportional to this pointwise product. So then we have two ways to compute Dempster's rule, either the mass-based expression, so uh, this one, or using the commonality function, so we convert each mass function to its associated commonality function. We take the, the product, normalize, and then this uh, commonality function is transformed back to a mass function. So I will come back later on the issue of uh, the computation of Dempster's rule. And uh, actually, we have a similar property for simple mass functions focused on the same subset. So as you can see here, when I compute the orthogonal sum of two simple mass functions focused on the same subset A, so the first mass function is characterized by the probability W1 of A and the second by W2 of A. So if I want to compute the orthogonal sum, I can simply take the product of the two probabilities. Okay. And so uh, Dempster's rule uh, plays a key role in the uh, Schaeffer theory because it allows us to decompose or obtain any, uh, some complex belief states as um, the combination of simple mass functions. So such mass functions are called uh, separable by, uh, by Schaeffer. Okay, if you can obtain your mass M as the combination by Dempster's rule of simple mass functions, then we will say that this function M is separable. And actually this decomposition uh, holds for a general, uh, more general class of belief functions which are the so-called non-dogmatic mass, non mass functions, which are the ones that allocate a positive mass to the whole frame. And this decomposition is based on the so-called uh, weight function, which is another equivalent representation of a mass function, which you can obtain from the commonality function here. And so we can show that any non dogmatic uh, mass function can be recovered from this W function by the same expression as we had on the previous slide. The only uh, difference is that some of the terms here the A uh, sub W A here may not be proper mass functions because this W A can be greater than one. So another interesting property of this weight function is that if you compute the orthogonal sum of two mass functions M1 and M2, then you can actually obtain it by just taking the pointwise product of the weight functions, like for the commonalities, it's the same thing. And this decomposition based on Dempster's rules is actually at play at various approaches, such as the generalized Bayesian theorem of Smets, the Ebinger Schalken error classifier, and the Dempster Schaeffer analysis of generalized linear classifier that Thierry Donneau uh, posed, and uh, some other things. And it is also the foundations to solutions to important problems, such as the fusion of non independent sources, which I will show uh, later. Okay, so now we'll speak about the, the computation of Dempster's rule. So as we have seen, the orthogonal sum can be computing, uh, computed in two ways, either using the mass-based uh, expression or by taking a detour through the, the commonality function. Here we compute the commonalities, take the project, normalize, and then transform back to a mass function. And at the end of the talk, if I have some time, I will show you uh, how this can be implement, implemented, uh, this, this approach, this commonality-based approach. So in terms of uh, computing times, the, the complexity of the mass bed approach uh, depends on the number of focal sets. And specifically, it is proportional to the cardinality of the frame times the number of focal sets of the first mass times the number of focal sets of the second mass. And for the commonality-based approach, the complexity is, uh, depends on the, on the size of the frame. And specifically, it is proportional to uh, the cardinality of the frame squared times the cardinality of the power set of the frame. If one uses the so-called fast Mobius transform to perform the conversions from the, uh, the mass function representation to the commonality function. So then which approach to use? 
Well, the mass based approach is more efficient if all the mass functions, uh, all of them have a number of focal sets that is much uh, smaller than the cardinality of the power set of the frame. And if there exists at least one of the mass functions that has a number of focal sets that is close to the, the number of elements in the power set of the frame, then the commonality based approach is likely to be faster. And in the worst case, there is an exponential complexity with the space and the size of the frame. However, for practical applications, this is rarely an obstacle for several reasons that I will detail uh, now. So the first reason is that uh, often the, the mass functions that we have to combine have some particular form, which can consider considerably uh, reduce uh, the complications. So in particular, if each of the mass function is a single mass fun function, simple uh, focus on the, on the singletons or on the complement of the singletons, then the complexity becomes uh, proportional to the size of the frame. Okay. Moreover, if the focal sets of the mass functions are restricted to be intervals, a notion that can be defined if omega is binary ordered, then the complexity becomes polynomial. So for instance, suppose we are interested in the duration in days of the river of the, of the faulty MacBook, and then say that the frame is one to 30, then an interval is a subset of omega, which contains all the values between, between two given bounds. Okay. So for instance, the interval 12, 16 means all the values between 12 and 16. And more generally, actually, the complexity is polynomial if there is a partial ordering of omega, so that the structure composed of omega and this partial ordering is a lattice, and the focal set of the mass functions are constrained to be intervals of that lattice, where the notion of interval here is defined similarly as on the previous slide. So in case you are not too familiar, or it's a bit uh, far, uh, far for you, for you uh, here is a brief refresher on lattices. So uh, the partial ordering on a finite set L is a reflexive and anti-symmetric and transitive relation on L. The structure uh, composed of L in this relation is called a partially ordered set or coset. And the coset is a lattice. If for every two elements of the, of the set L, there is a unique greatest lower bound, which we call the mid, and the unique least upper bound, which we call the jump. And so the complexity here is polynomial because if we combine two mass functions that have interval focal sets by themselves rule, it will give us a mass function that also has interval focal sets. Okay, because the intersection of two intervals is an interval, which can be obtained by taking the, the join of the lower bounds and the mid of the upper bounds. So this result is interesting because it makes it possible to tackle applications such as multi-level classification, ensemble clustering, and preference aggregation, involving the manipulation of mass functions defined on uh, very large frames. And which are just intractable in the usual case. Indeed, in such applications, uh, mass functions have only, uh, having only interval focal sets are naturally encountered. And I will give two examples of that. So, first, for the problem of multi level classification. So, in this problem, the instances they belong to several classes at the same time. So, for instance, a song can have a, can generate several, several emotions. So, let's fit up be the set of classes. And the class level X of an instance takes values in omega, which is the power set of theta. Okay. So in terms of notation, let omega A denote the element of omega corresponding to the subset A of theta. Then there is a natural partial ordering on, on omega, which corresponds to the natural partial ordering of theta, which is the inclusion. And so if we consider an interval omega A or big, omega B of the uh, induced lattice here, then this will be an imprecise specification of the, of the class label of an instance. It means it surely contains all elements of A, it surely contains no element of the complement of A. And such an interval here is a natural way to express the, an expert imprecise knowledge about the class label of a training instance. And so if you predict the class label of a dense instance from such training data, using uh, the most common classifier, let's say, of the, um, the function, so the even a shank can your neighbor classifier, then formally this will amount to combining mass functions having interval focal sets. So another example is in the domain of ensemble clustering. So I recall here that the clustering uh, of a set of n objects amounts to finding a partition of, of this set. So here the set is uh, theta. And so 
omega here is a set of all partitions of, of theta. And the true partition X of the, obje of the objects takes uh, values in omega. And in this problem, there is also a natural partial ordering on omega. So we said that omega is the partition omega is finer than the partition omega prime if the clusters of omega can be obtained by splitting those of omega prime. So in this case, yes, if you consider an interval uh, omega overline, omega, um, omega underline, sorry, omega overline of the, of the, of the, the, the lattice that you obtain, then this is an imprecise specification of the true partition. It means that the true partition is coarser than omega under, underline and finer than omega overline. So for instance, if you have the piece of information that the objects of a given set A belong to the same cluster, then this can be represented by the interval omega A, uh, omega theta, where omega B here means the partition where only the objects in B are clustered together. So just such intervals here are a natural way to interpret the output of a clustering algorithm. And so if we predict the true partition from an ensemble of such clustering algorithms, while accounting for the validity of the partitions, then again, formally, this amounts to uh, combining mass functions having interval focal sets. Okay, so uh, another reason why Demsol's rule, uh, the complexity of Demsol's rule is not such an issue in practice is that often what, when we do in certain reasoning, what we do, what we want to do at the end is to make a decision. And the usual decision rule is to select the singleton that, that has the largest possibility or equivalently the largest commonality. And so thanks to the property that we have seen before, then the complexity is linear in this case. We use this, this rule for deciding. And the final reason why uh, the complexity of the rule is not just such an issue is that when you cannot do the exact computation, then you can always resort to approximation procedure. So there are these two kinds of approximation procedures, so the stochastic ones and the deterministic ones. So the stochastic ones are very efficient if you uh, need to combine the to compute the combined belief in the subset A. So in particular, you have some Monte Carlo algorithms that can uh, do that in linear time. However, these approaches are not uh, suitable when one is interested in the whole combined belief function. So in this case, we can resort to deterministic approximation procedures. And these procedures will provide you with some upper and lower bounds on the combined belief. So there are two kinds of uh, deterministic approximation procedures. You, are, you have those that are designed for the mass-based uh, approach to the combination, and you have those that rely on the commonality-based approach to the combination. So in the following, I will take some time to uh, explain these deterministic approximation procedures, and I will spend more time on, on the mass-based, uh, the ones that designed for the mass-based approach because they are the most uh, common. So uh, when we use the mass-based expression for Demsos rule, the complexity depends on the number of focal sets. So a useful uh, strategy here is then to approximate the mass functions by simpler ones having fewer focal sets. And uh, there are several ways to do that, but the simplest method is the so-called summarization algorithm. So it works as follows. Uh, let F1 to FR be the focal set of a mass function M ranked by decreasing mass. And let k be the maximum allowed number of focal sets. So if r is greater than k, what we will do is that the r minus k plus one focal set fk to fr will be replaced, replaced by the union. So in this case, we will approximate the mass function of m here by another mass function, which I will denote by phi plus of m, which is defined like this. So you see for the focal sets f1 to fk minus one, in this new mass function, we, we allocate the same mass as in the original mass function. And in the union of the focal sets fk to fr, we allocate the sum of the mass given to these focal sets in the original mass. So for short, to say, here we say that uh, fk to fr are aggregated. So this approximation phi plus uh, of m, you can easily check that it is uh, less informative than the original mass m, and we call it an outer approximation because it includes the original mass. And so thanks to this property and this other one here, which is that the Aujourd'hui rule is monotonic with respect to uh, the specialization ordering. So what does this mean? It means that if I have a mass function M that is more informative than another mass function M prime, and if I combine M with any other mass function M zero, the result will be more uh, informative, more specific than the combination of M prime with M zero. So thanks to these two properties here, we have this result here, which says the, the following. So if you consider the combination of n mass functions using the conjunctive rule, a normalized Demsos rule here, 
this is how, how I will denote it. And if on, on the other hand, you, you aggregate the mass functions one at a time, and at each at each aggregation, you combination, you summarize the result. Okay, so you perform uh, combine one, one at a time the mass functions, do summarization, then combine again, so do some summarization. What you get at the end is this mass function M plus, which happens to include the um, the conjunctive combination. So it is an outer approximation of the conjunctive combination of the n mass functions m1 to mn. And what is nice here is that when you compute this m plus, the community explosion associated to the combination is avoided. And so in the summarization procedure that I explained, uh, if we replace the focal set fk to fr by their intersection rather than their union, we get another approximation of the original mass function, which I will denote by phi minus of m. And this time, this approximation is included in m. Okay. That's why we call it an inner approximation of m. And if this, this other, but this variation of this summarization procedure, we do the same thing as we did before. So we combine mass function at one at a time and do an approximation. Then we get a mass function m run, m minus, sorry, which will be included in the conjunctive combination. So, um, so we have this inner and outer approximations of the conjunctive combination. And thanks to the property of the specialization ordering, we can directly get this, this thing here, which is that from this inner and outer approximations of M, we get these bounds on the plausibility function. And similarly, we can also obtain some <clears throat> bounds on the belief function. So here we were looking at the conjunctive combination or normalized Debsor's rule combination of the N mass functions. So now I'm going to look at the orthogonal sum of this mass function M1 to Mn. Now it's very easy to show that the plausibility function associated to the orthogonal sum can be computed from the plausibility function associated to the conjunctive sum. And so from the inner and outer approximations of the conjunctive combination, you can get lower and upper bounds on the plausibility function associated to the orthogonal sum. And similarly, also we can bound on the plausibility function. Okay, so now I'm going to take a, a closer look at this summarization procedure. So let m be a mass function. The summarization algorithm produces a less formative approximation, five plus of m of m. Okay. And how does it work? It works by aggregating the unimportant focal sets, those that have the lowest mass. And they are unimportant in the sense that we not they, they will not incur too much information loss. Because when we approximate M, indeed we do not want to, to lose the this informative content. But we can ask how much information is lost by the summarization of M. So to measure that, uh, we can use um, a measure called the cardinality of a mass function, which is defined like this here. Yeah? So we denote the cardinality of M. Uh, with this the bar on M, and so it's the sum of all A's of the product of M A times the cardinality of M. And the idea here is that the greater the cardinality of M, the less informative M is. And we have this nice property with the specialization ordering is that if M1 is more informative than M2, in the sense of this ordering here, then the cardinality of M1 will be uh, lower than the cardinality of M2. Hence, we can measure the information loss by this summarization of M, by this measure, this measure delta here, which is simply defined as the cardinality of the approximation minus the cardinality of the original mass function. So here's the second remark concerning the summarization algorithm. So we can remark that it involves a specific partition of the set of focal sets. So a partition that contains K elements with the elements from I1 to IK minus one corresponds to the focal set F1 to FK minus one. And the last element, IK, corresponds to the focal set that are aggregated, okay, the FK to FR. So if we make this remark, we can see that the mass function phi plus of M can be re rewritten simply in this form here. So it allocates to the sum of the focal sets that belong to this element I of the partition, the sum of the mass given to these focal sets in the original mass function. So we can just summarize the summarization algorithm like this, if you want. But there exist other partitions of the set of focal sets of size k. Okay, so let's phi plus of 
P here be the outer approximation of M, which is obtained for some partition P of the set of Fogel sets using the equation that we had on the previous slide. Then we can try to search for the best outer approximation, phi cross P star, by searching for the partition P star here, which minimizes the information loss. So you see, I am at my measure here of the information loss for a given approximation based on some partition P. And I will try to look for the best partition possible, where here PK is the set of all partitions of the set of focal sets of size K. So unfortunately, an exhaustive search in this set of, uh, all, of all partitions is in general not possible because uh, the number of uh, partitions of a set of size uh, R into K clusters are rapidly explodes, even for small values of R. So we need to resort to heuristic search techniques and the uh, hierarchical clustering algorithm has been proposed by Thierry uh, for that purpose. So uh, it works as follows. So pairs of focal sets are, are grouped sequentially. So at, at, at each step, the two closest uh, focal sets according to some distance measure are aggregated until the desired number K of focal sets has been reached. And the, the complexity of this uh, is time proportional to R cube. And so the distance measure that is used is the following. So the distance between two focal sets Fi and Fj is defined, can be defined formally like this, but the idea is very simple. It's, it's just evaluate this distance measure, evaluates how much information is lost with respect to a given mass function M if its focal sets Fi and Fj are aggreg aggregated. So we can read that uh, later if you want, but the idea is, is Okay, so let uh, phi plus p hat denote the outer approximation of a mass function m obtained using this hierarchical clustering based approach, which I will call the outer clustering approximation for short. Of course, there is no guarantee that it will yield the same lowest information loss as the approximation phi plus p star. But at least it has been shown empirically to yield better result than the, the mass uh, summarization. Okay. And much as the summarization procedure can be adapted to obtain an inner approximation, phi minus, this more complex uh, approximation procedure here, based on the clustering, can be adapted to find an inner clustering approximation, which I can denote by phi minus phi hat of n. And uh, just a small remark here is that the inner, inner and outer approximations that we get using this more complex uh, procedure here, they will not uh, rely in general on the same partition P hat of the set of cassettes contrarily to the summarization process. Okay, so um, thanks to this uh, inner and outer clustering approximations, we can do what we did before with the summarization, which is that we can combine mass functions one at a time using the conjunctive rule and then perform an approximation. And this will give us two approximations of the conjunctive combination. One will be, again, an inner approximation, and another one will be an outer approximation of the conjunctive combination. So again, thanks to this approach, we can obtain bounds on the plausibility function associated to the orthogonal sum of the end mass function. Okay, so that was for uh, approximation procedures for the mass-based approach. Now I will speak a bit about um, an approximation procedure that relies on the communality-based approach to the combination. So when we use the communality-based approach, the complexity no longer depends on the number of focal sets, but it depends on the, the cardinality of the frame. So then, in this case, uh, an idea, a useful idea, is to approximate omega by a simpler, so course of frame theta with pure elements. So I'm lucky because Thierry explained what is a, a course of it. Yeah. So, uh, so, so an, an algorithm has been proposed based on this idea. For the combination of n mass functions. So first, we should search for using again an hierarchical clustering procedure for a partition corresponding theta of uh, omega, so the given size c, which minimize the information loss defined like this. So here you see the overall of information, uh, information loss will be the information loss if you replace each mass function mi, so each of them here, by an outer approximation. This outer approximation, what is it? It is the one we obtain if we carry the mass function mi to the corresponding theta. So this gives us what is called the outer, uh, the restriction in Schaeffer's book. So we shall denote here mi bar. And then carry uh, back the result to omega using the vacuous extension. So we try to find the, for the best, let's say, best corresponding theta of omega like this. 
And then using the commonality based approach, we perform the combination of the mass functions in this Poisson frame. And the last step is that we carry the results of this mass function here. We apply the vacuous extension and send it back to omega, and we get this mass function m bar here. And it happens that m bar is an outer approximation of the conjunctive combination of the n mass function. So the Building time for this is proportional to this uh, quantity here. So I recall here the, the, the C is the, the size of the course on frame, and N is the number of mass functions. And this algorithm can also be adapted to obtain an inner approximation of M on the line of the conjunctive combination. So again, what we will get using this approach, which is very different from the one that we had before, but at the end, we all, also get some inner and outer approximations of the uh, conjunctive combination. And so again, we can get some lower and upper bounds on the plausibility function associated to the orthogonal here. Okay, so uh, I will now uh, discuss a bit about the applicability of, the, of Gamsa's rule. This is something that you have seen this morning, more or less the same, this slide. So the famous Zade example, so I take time to, to speak about it because I think it's quite important. So here's the example that Thierry used, okay. Yes, you remember. So we have two mass functions. Okay, one uh, given by two experts. One tells that C is impossible. This one tells that A is impossible. We compute the orthogonal sum, and we find that it's B, uh, the, the uh, true value of, of X. Huh? And so uh, as we, I just repeat quickly what Thierry said. So as both experts consider B to be very unlikely, some also can this result to be counterintuitive in the equation of the rule. So just to say difference with Thierry, this morning, here I emphasize this part here. If you accept the assumptions underlying the Amstel's rule, then this is the only reasonable conclusion. Okay? So you say you assume your, your sources are independent and reliable. So in this case, you can only, the only reasonable conclusion is that uh, B is the only remaining possibility. So here, my point here is that the question is not whether the Amstel's rule produces some results or not, but rather whether its underlying assumptions hold. Okay? And so we need a way to assess the validity of these assumptions. So one way to do that is to look at the degree of conflict, which has been shown to satisfy a set of desirable properties for a conflict measure. That is a measure of the inconsistency resulting from making assumptions that the messages are reliable and independent. And so if we look at this example, we find that the conflict is very, very high, which suggests that maybe if you are not happy with the result that you are the assumptions that you are using to get this to this result may not be valid. Okay. So that's why we need alternative rules corresponding to other assumptions. See, that's why alternative rules have been proposed. So let me sum up what we have seen. So let's M1 and M2 be two uh, mass functions induced by two randomly coded messages. The assumptions that lead to them source rules are that the messages are independent. Okay, the probability that the messages mean A and B respectively is M1A times M2B. And the messages are reliable. So if the messages mean A and B, then the overall message should be the intersection of A and B. And so all the rules corresponding to other assumptions have been proposed. And uh, so I will recall a few of them, starting with assumptions, uh, rules making other assumptions about the reliability of the sources. And then I will discuss how to handle uh, the dependence between the sources. So the first rule is the disjunctive rule. So let us suppose uh, now that at least one or two messages inducing M1 and M2 is reliable, which means that if the actual codes used were CI and C prime J, we can only conclude that X belongs to the union of AI and BJ. This leads to, them, uh, to, 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 to the disjunctive rule, okay, which has the same definition as the Amstel's rule, except that the union, the intersection has been replaced by the union here. And it also satisfies similar properties, so the commutativity, associativity, and we get back for the commonalities here, we get an expression but on point wise product of the belief function. So the last point I wanted to mention at the bottom here is that uh, we can replace actually, yeah, we have seen the um, Damsos rule is based on the intersection here. The disjunctive rule is the union, but you can actually uh, replace these operators by any other um, binary Boolean collective and provide an interpretation that you rule that you, to the rule that you get if you do that. 
And on this topic, you can see, uh, for instance, uh, the lecture I gave at the last uh, school uh, in 2019. And so to connect with what uh, Prakash showed this morning, actually, all these rules you can, uh, to, to, to provide the interpretation to these rules, you can devise a, a graphical model that models, that models all the pieces of information or, uh, that represent uh, the, the, this, the, the given combination rule. So uh, let's say this, for this rule, for instance, for the um, disjunctive rule, you have some variables that model the reliability of each of the source, and then you have some mass function on this variable that says, okay, at least one of the two sources is reliable. So you can have a graphical model that uh, then, then you combine all the piece of information, you marginalize on the variable of interest, and you recover this rule or another rule based on some other connecting. Okay. And also you can get some other rules in this way with the graphical model, in particular the, the scheme that I will explain here. So, so suppose a given message is using a given mass, it's reliable with some probability alpha, and unreliable with probability one minus alpha. In this case, the probability that uh, the message means X belongs to A is alpha times MA, and that it means nothing is uh, alpha times M omega plus one minus alpha. And the mass that you get, mass function that you get if you do that, is known as the discounting of, of M with discount rate one minus alpha. Okay. So it's a classical operation already in Schaeffer's book. And so if now you have two messages and you see two mass functions M1 and M2, and if you suppose that they have independent probabilities alpha 1 and alpha 2 of being reliable, then what you infer about X is represented by this mass function M DC for discount and combine, combine, which is simply the discounting of M1 with the probability alpha 1. Uh, with, um, combined with uh, M2 discounting with the degree alpha 2 here. And this combination method here where you discount sources and then combine them by the themselves rule is very often used in practice. And also you can extend it to refine form of knowledge about the sources. So here we have a very basic uh, form of knowledge about the source. Uh, it's reliable with some probability alpha, but you have some refined form of knowledge about the, the the sources, yeah, which you can model using, for instance, what we call a contextual correction. And on this topic, you can see uh, David Mercier's lecture at the 2017 school in Chan. Okay, so another scheme which is, looks similar to the one I showed before, but it's slightly different, is the following. So you can assume that the first message is reliable and the second is not reliable with some probability alpha one. And the first message is not reliable and the second is reliable with probability one minus alpha one. So if you have this meta knowledge about the sources, your, uh, what you can infer about the variable X here is the convex combination of the two mass functions M1 and M2. So be careful because this is not the same as this, okay? The weighted average convex combination of M1 and M2 is not the same as discounting each mass and then combining by the orthogonals. <clears throat> and so these two methods are neither commutative nor associative. Uh, another rule which I would like to mention is uh, this one. So for lack of, we call it often Dubois and Fraser's rule, okay? So this rule, what, uh, what, what does it do is allocate the probability M1A times M2B to the intersection of A and B if this intersection is not empty. And if it is empty, we allocate this product to the union of A and B. So, so you see it's somewhat intermediate between Demsel's rule and the disjunctive rule. And as a matter of fact, if the conflict is equal to zero, then we, this rule reduces to Demsel's rule. And if the conflict is one, then you get the disjunctive. And this rule is commutative, also insensitive to vacuum key formation, so it has a vacuous mass function as neutral element. And it's also been shown to satisfy six other basic fusion properties. However, it is not associative. Okay, so so far, all the rules that I have presented, uh, they assume that these uh, the messages are independent, which is a particular case of non-dependence between the, the, the sources. Okay, because in general, the dependence induces a joint probability M1, 2 of A, B, that the messages mean A and B. And this mapping that you see here is so-called joint mass function, which verifies that its marginals are M1 and M2. The independence case that we have used so far, 
the particular case where M12 of AB is equal to the product of M1 A and M2B. And all the rules that we have seen, uh, the MSOS rule and all the other ones, you can extend them to the case where you know the dependence between the messages. If you replace this product M1A and M2B by this, this uh, joint probability here, M12 of AB. The problem is that in practice, it's difficult to describe the nature of the, uh, the dependence in this way. So we need another approach to enter the case of non dependent uh, pieces of evidence. And I will present such an approach, which is based on the principle that you have seen this morning. So now you know. So the least commitment principle, which I stated again quickly. So you, when you have several B functions that are compatible with the set of constraints that you have, you should select the least informative if it exists. Okay. And this principle to for it to be operational, we need some information informational ordering that allows us to compare the informative contents of mass functions. So we have already seen this one, the information the specialization ordering. Uh, Thierry presented this morning two other orderings uh, based on the plausibility function and one on the commonality function. And so there is actually some other uh, uh, orderings between uh, mass functions and in particular the one that is here. So we call it the W ordering or the weight ordering. So we said that M1 is more informative than M2 if M1 can be uh, equals the M2, the orthogonal of M2 is some other mass function M that is separable. And so this condition can be checked very easily by looking at the weight functions of M1 and M2. So you will have M1 more informative than M2 according to this ordering if the weights uh, given by M1 to, uh, to set A are lower than uh, those given by M2. So now that we have a, a means to make the listening uh, principle operational, let us see how we can help us to deal with the problem of non independent pieces of evidence, and in particular the case where these pieces of evidence are uh, reliable. So an approach to tackle this problem is the so-called cautious merging. And the idea of the of merging, uh, the cautious merging of reliable pieces of evidence is that a minimal requirements is that the, the result of the combination should be more informative than both M1 and M2. But of course, there are several uh, mass functions that are more informative than M1 and M2. And so that's where the least commitment principle comes into play. It tells, it tells us that we should select the least informative element among the more informative uh, mass functions than M1 and M2. So if you use the S ordering, you cannot guarantee the existence or the uniqueness of the of this mass function, this more informative mass function, this least more informative mass function. But if you use the W ordering, then you can show that it exists and it is unique, which is nice. So as long as uh, M1 and M2 um, are non-normative, okay, then you can find it simply by taking the minimum of these weights. Okay. And the uh, the rule that we get in this case has been called the closest rule of combination. So it's Thierry Dono that presented it. Proposed. So this rule uh, satisfies a uh, number of properties. So first, it is communicative and associative. It's also monotonic with respect to the W ordering. But what makes it very uh, suitable to the combination of non independent uh, pieces of evidence are these two properties, uh, which is that it is uh, inimportant. And also, we have that Dempsey's rule is distributive with respect to the closest rule. So it means that when you combine overlapping pieces of evidence, then the common part here, which is M1, is not counted twice. And also, I should mention here this property, which is that it is sensitive to back close information in a general case. Okay, so um, there exists a disjunctive counterpart to the quantity rule, which is called the wall rule. And this rule corresponds to the assumptions that uh, at least one of the pieces of evidence is reliable. And uh, it has been given by non independent uh, pieces of evidence. And it amounts to taking the minimum this time of so called uh, disjunctive weights, okay, which is the disjunctive counterpart to the weights we have seen so far. So be careful also if you look at the literature, the terminology uh, varies a bit. You've got the, this weight here. Uh, there is a, another, uh, you can make some transformation of this weight against some other weights. But uh, here I'm using the old terminology, but you may see some new uh, terminology. Okay, so this all the rules that I have shown so far, 
So the, the, the dancers roll the ball, the projective roll, the disjunctive roll, and the ball roll can show actually that they belong to some infinite families of projective and disjunctive uh, combination rules, which you can obtain if you replace the product or the minimum in the definitions by uh, uninorms or triangular norm defined on the extended positive reals. So for instance, here I have this family of rules, which have been called the denorm based conjunctive rules. So you see same thing as the cosinus rule, except that here's the generalization. We don't have the minimum, but we have a T norm, triangular norm on the extended positive rule here. So you recover the cosinus rule if you if the T norm here is the minimum. And all of these rules are commutative, associative, or monotonic with respect to the W ordering. And in addition, the what we call the union and bed rules are in addition associative to vacuous information. And what makes these rules uh, interesting is that we can obtain, obtain parameters, versions uh, of them. So in this can be useful to uh, adapt the combination to the degree of dependence between the sources, as we will see uh, later in, uh, in the example. Okay, so so far I've, disc I've presented a binary combination rules, that is rules for the combination of, of two mass functions. But what if we receive n mass functions? So what I've been presenting the following is uh, the NRE extensions of these, these rules. So for the for all the associated rules, it's, it's very easy because uh, the NRE extensions of the Dempsey's rule, the Dirichlet rule, Cosentino rule, and the Ball rule. Mm. Uh, it, the extensions verify that you can obtain it by an uh, iterative combination like this. Okay. So here I, I listed below the associated assumptions for the NRE extensions. So if you use them to rule to combine n mass functions, it means that you assume that all the pieces of evidence are independent and reliable. If you use the disjunctive rule, it means that the pieces of evidence are independent and at least one of them is reliable, but you do not know which one. The Cosius rule is uh, you assume that piece of evidence are non-independent, but you cannot be precise about their dependence and that they are reliable. <coughs> and the ball rule is uh, piece of evidence, pieces of evidence are non-independent, and at least one of them is reliable. For the non-associative rules, you cannot uh, obtain the NRE extension just by an iterative combination. We need to we need to provide the explicit definition. So for Dubois for the price rule, it goes as follows. So the product of m one a times up to n, m n a n is allocated to the union of the intersections of the maximal consistent subsets of the focus sets a one to a n. So where I recall that the maximal consistent subset of a given set of subsets is a subset of this set that uh, whose intersection is non-empty and maximal with this property. And for the other two combination schemes, it's very straightforward. So the discounting combine, you just discount each mass some degree alpha i, then you compute the orthogonal sum. And for the weighted average, it's just a complex combination of the n mass functions. There is another interesting rule in the case of uh, n mass function. Uh, which some people call the Q relaxation rule because it extends the Q relaxation technique from interval analysis. So this rule has the same definition as Dubois and Prouse rule, except that the function MCS, a maximal consistent subset, has been replaced by this function here, relax R, which, what, what, what does it mean, this function? It returns the set of subsets of the focuses A1 to a, a n of cardinality R. And the um, assumption, the underlying assumption to, uh, of this rule is that R out of the n pieces of evidence are reliable. And so the properties is that for R equals n, you recover the source rule, and for R equals one, you recover uh, the disjunctive. So this is already mentioned, and this rule is also commutative. Okay. So uh, we have seen uh, several combination rules. So this begs the question, uh, which rule should we use in a given problem? So in the ideal situation where reliability and the independence of the mass functions MI are clear, then clearly you should use them so well. However, uh, what if the reliability is unknown, is unknown or the independence cannot be assumed? So in this case, we can distinguish two situations. 
either we do not have any label data to assess the effectiveness of a particular uh, rule f. Okay, so in this case, it basically means that the only thing you have are the n mass functions here. So then in this case, you can resort to some principles. And so the first idea is to use a rule that has some good properties, uh, is well justified and is robust to what you don't know about your sources. A second approach is to select a rule according to, um, based on the notions of consistency and formativeness, which are the two main features one may seek regarding the knowledge about the variable of interest. And the second situation is you have some, you do have some label data, which allows you to learn say, the, the rule that uh, optimizes some performance measure. So in the following, I will detail these three, these three ways to uh, select a given rule. So starting with the, uh, the robust combination. So the idea of a robust combination rule is to use a rule that is well behaved, uh, that can be handled in a reasonable uh, and effective way, what you don't know about the sources. So in this case, I think a sensible proposal, a sensible rule to use is so this one, maybe you don't recall, but this is Dubois and Poit rule, okay, the, the one with the star. It has been shown to satisfy uh, a lot of uh, say desirable properties for a combination rule. However, if the number of sources to combine is large, then you, have, you may find it difficult to apply this rule because it is quite uh, computationally intensive. So in this case, I think uh, a nice alternative is uh, what can be called the ransack rule or ransack best rule that was proposed by Thierry, used recently in a in paper for, in the context of distributed fusion. So this rule works as follows. Uh, two steps. First, you so you have n mass functions to combine. First step is you estimate which of the mass functions should be considered reliable. The moment you have done that, you simply return the, the orthogonal sum of the mass functions that have been considered reliable. Okay, so the, the result, so if I denote this rule by this, this symbol here, so when I combine M1 to Mn, simply I return the orthogonal sum of the mass function Mi with R here means reliable, okay? So how do you find, so do you estimate or consider that a given function is, a mass function is reliable? So with this approach, the mass functions that are considered reliable are those that are sufficiently consistent with the model that has the highest number of sufficiently consistent mass functions with it. It's basically what these two lines here means. And when I say a model, a model is what, what is a model is you take a, a random subset of the mass functions and you compute, and you compute their orthogonal sum. Okay. So it's inspired by the Ronsack algorithm. I think it's pretty, it's pretty nice. It has been shown to be rough also. Okay, so that's why it's for the case where you can assume that your sources are independent and uh, but you don't know their reliability. Or the case where the sources are not independent, but you can safely assume that they're all reliable, reliable then for me it's quite clear that you should uh, use useful uh, for this case. If the, the assumption that they are all reliable seems too strong, then you can make the weaker assumptions that uh, at least one of them is, is reliable, which to me is a conservative, conservative way to, to handle the case of unknown reliability. So in this case, you will use the ball. Okay, so this small table summarizes what I just said. So in the case where you can assume that the sources are independent and all reliable, you use them as rule. If you can assume that they are independent, but you don't know their reliability, I think you should try to use the uh, use Dubois and Kras rule. It makes a lot of sense in this case. And if there are a lot of sources, then the ransack based rule also is, is interesting. If uh, the sources are not independent, but you can say, you can assume that they are all reliable, then you use this use rule. And if you don't know the reliability, then you will use the double rule. Okay. So that's one way to, uh, to, uh, to select a rule when you don't have any data. Another approach is to, uh, to select a rule based on the notions of cons consistency and informativeness, and specifically a trade off between these two notions. So to um, explain and motivate this, uh, this approach, I will take a, a basic example. So suppose you have three sources about some variable X defined on the domain omega containing three elements here, A, B, and C. The source one tells you that X belongs to A1, A1 being a small A here. The second source tells you uh, the true value of X is uh, one of A and B. And the first source tells you, I know it's, it should be B or C. 
So if you make the assumptions, which I will leave that by R1, that all the sources are reliable, then you get, with, with the intersection of the three sets here, A1, A2, A3, you get the empty set. Okay. So you get an inconsistent result, so it means that uh, these assumptions cannot work. If you make the weak assumptions, which I will call denote by R3 here, that at least one of the sources is reliable, okay, then you get a consistent result because you get, you get the, the whole frame. However, this result is useless as it is not informative at all. So you can make an intermediate assumption, R2, which is at least one of two sources are reliable. So in this case, the, the operation that we need to perform is we need to make the intersection of all the so you get A1, A2, A1, A3, A2, A3, and then the union because it's at least two of the sources are reliable. And then in this case, you get the conclusion that the actual value of X is either a small A or small B. So you get a result that is consistent. So the assumption is plausible and also informative, or at least more informative that than uh, in this case here where you, where you got the whole frame. So in this case, this assumption R2 is preferable to R1 and R3, but for other pieces of information provided by the sources, it could be R1 or R3, because you can show that you always have C1, the conclusion reached if you make the assumption that they are all reliable, is included in C2, which is included in C3. Okay, so the fact is that the assumption R, R J plus one will always give the result that is on the one end at least as consistent as that of RG, RJ, but also on the other end, at most as specific as that of RJ. So we see here that the notions of consistency and informativeness are somewhat antagonist goals. If you want informativeness, we lose on consistency, and if you want consistency, we will lose on informativeness. Okay, so there is a kind of trade-off search between these two notions. And then sensible strategy for a given uh, pieces of information provided by the free sources. To test iteratively each of these assumptions, RJ, and select the first one which yields a consistent result. In this case, we get the most informative and consistent possible results for this problem. So, when we have mass functions, much as when we have received pieces of information in the form of sets, we want the result to be as informative as possible, but at the same time, we want this result to be consistent. Okay? So, to enforce this strategy, we can extend the strategy I just explained. So first, if we consider a set of rules such that the result of the combination by, by the rule fj, so mj here denotes the result of the combination of n mass functions by the rule fj, is more informative than the result by the rule fj plus one. Also, you want to guarantee that if you use the rule fj plus one, you get a result that is more consistent than if you use the rule fj. And then you can test iteratively each of the rules until you get some satisfactory consistency value. So in other words, here you try first with the rule that will give the most informative results. And if the consistency induced is too low, then you try and search for other rules by gradually decreasing the informativeness until you reach a satisfactory consistency level. So this approach was originally proposed and studied in the context of the transferable belief model. For two particular choices of this informational ordering here and, and this consistency measure here. So uh, it was the specialization ordering and the consistency measure is called uh, logical consistency and it is based on the plausibility uh, on, the, on the contour function. So what you can show is that if you have a mass function n that is more informative than n prime according to this specialization ordering, then the consistency of, of n prime will be greater than that of of n. So we see here that when pieces of information are modeled by, by mass functions, like we had for, for sets, consistency and informativeness are again at fault. Okay. We can show that a similar proposition holds for the W star ordering, which is the informational ordering based on the, what we can call the TBM weight function, which assigns some weight to the empty set and that has the same definition as the weight function I showed before. We have also a similar proposition for another information ordering, which is based on the disjunctive weight function that I mentioned earlier. And so thanks to this proposition, so, uh, so basically so thanks to this here, yeah. uh, so we simply need to choose set of rules such that the result of the combination by the rule FJ is more informative than the result of the combination by the rule FJ plus one. And this would guarantee that the consistency of the rule uh, FJ plus one will be greater than that of the 
consistent C of, of using the rule FJ, which is the condition required in the first step in the sweaters. And what is nice also is that we can find some set of rules F that are adapted to the different uh, reliability uh, dependent situations that um, unknown reliability dependent situations that we may face. So uh, let me provide some examples. So um, in the case where you can assume the sources to be independent, but you don't know their reliability, then you can, you can use this consistency formatting left trade-off approach with the Q relation rule, where here the rule FJ corresponds to the assumption that N minus J plus one of the sources are reliable. If you can make a, a bit of a stronger assumption, that at least you know that they have independent reliabilities, then you can use this scheme, this approach with the discount and combined method. Now, in the case where uh, you can uh, assume that the sources are reliable, but they are not independent, then you can use this CIT approach with, uh, where here the rule FJ will be a positive T rule based on some, some, some T norm TJ here, which has to be lower than that of the rule uh, FJ plus one. And in the case where you don't know the reliability of the sources and they are not independent, then you can use the same thing as, as here, again, with some T norm that has to respect some properties. Okay, so here is an illustration of this uh, consistency, consistency informativeness approach. Uh, so it was for a problem of the project BMUs of the Nuclear uh, Energy Agency. So in this problem, there were 10 sources, which corresponded to nuclear computer codes. And these sources here, they, they provide a certain estimates of parameter values of nuclear power plants. Okay. And this kind of application here, the, the data are costly, the phenomena involved are complex. So there is no ways to estimate the reliability of the sources. So we apply this approach here where we choose the, the set of rules here was, so the rule FJ corresponds to the assumption that N minus J plus one out of the N sources are reliable. And here I show the results for a specific parameter, the PCT2 parameter. So what is M1 here is the result of combining the 10 sources with the rule F1, and the rule F1 corresponds to the assumption that all the sources are reliable. And if we apply this rule, we get a very low consistency. Okay. And if we move to the rule F2, the second rule, the second rule corresponds to the assumption that nine out of the 10 sources here are reliable, and you get much more consistent results. And if you get to the next rule, the rule, the rule number three here, corresponds to the assumption that eight out of the 10 sources and 10 nuclear computer codes are reliable, and you get a totally consistent result. And in addition, you, we find that two of the values of this parameter are definitely more possible than the other. So when we apply this approach on this problem, we obtain results that are consistent, informative, and also, which is very important for this kind of applications, are readable by the end user. Okay, so this is a summary of what we've seen so far. So, um, so this I just added this this part here with the CIT. So, for the, for the various situations that you may face with respect to what you know or don't know about the sources, you have the CIT here with a given rule for the for the situation that you may face. The last part is uh, now we assume that we have some data allowing us to uh, evaluate the performance of a, of a given one. So here the setting is the following. You have L objects, and for each of these objects, uh, you have observed the true values of the, the variable of interest. Okay. And for each of the, mass, uh, of the objects, we get N mass functions about value of the variable. So we assume here that we have some loss function which evaluates the error of knowing M, the mass function M about X, for a given object whose true value is X out. So then from a set of rules, a set F of rule, you can pick the one that minimizes the average loss. Obviously here, depending on the choice of L and F, you may get a more or less complex optimization problem. So typically, this loss function here corresponds to transforming the mass function M into a probability measure, and then using either the squared error or the cross entropy loss, which are defined here, classical losses. And for the, the, the set of rules, it's convenient to choose uh, a set that is uh, that contains a parameterized family of rules. 
So for the like for the CIT approach, for the case of well, you know the sources are independent, but you don't know the reliability. You can use this approach with the pure electrical rule, or with the discount and combined method, in which case the parameters are the alpha i. For the case where uh, the sources are reliable but uh, non-independent, then you can use the T-norm-based probability rule. For some family of T-norm here, TS determined by a parameter s. In this family, you can also use it for the case where uh, the sources are non-independent and you don't know the, the reliability, and then you would use the disjunctive T rules. So here's an example of this uh, approach for the case of uh, sources that are assumed to be reliable but not independent. So it's uh, from this paper from Benjamin Cost and his colleagues. So in this, in this paper, they consider the following uh, binary classification problem with 10 features. And one classifier was learned for each of the features, and we had um, 10 classifiers. And conditionally, in each class, the, there was a correlation a sigma between any two of the first nine features. And the last feature was independent from all the other ones. So this framework, this experiment, um, mimic the situation where there are nine dependent classifiers and the 10th classifier, which is independent from the others. And so for each of the objects, the IF classifier produces a mass function MI. And the 10 of 10 mass functions, so we have 10 classifiers, are combined in, the, combined in this paper using a parameterized rule, the one I mentioned earlier. But here you see this parameter S can take a value between 0 and 1. And for the extreme values, we recover the, the Cossius rule. And so for S tends to 0 here. And for S equals 1, we have the Dempster's rule. And the error criterion that we use, so this first function here, has the uh, finity community transformation with the squared error. So here are some results. So what you see here is the on the x-axis, you've got the parameter value. So when you go to the far left, you get the Cossius rule. On the right, you get Dempster's rule. On the y-axis here, you get the, the error. And what you see is that for a, a local relation, the optimal rule is very close to Dempster's rule. Okay. Now, for a, a case of highly dependent classifiers, so very high correlation, what you see here is that this is the cautious rule that is optimal in this case. Okay. And now for a case where the correlation is between these two extremes, we see that the best result, the, the lowest error, is obtained for some rule that is in between the cautious rule and the depth of rule. So overall here we see that there is no rule that is the best in all the cases, which uh, shows the necessity to adapt the combination to the data. To the data. Okay, so this is my, my table from before, augmented with the possibility to learn to, to the earlier um, the rule uh, with respect to the different situations that you may face uh, with respect to what you know or don't know about the, the sources. Okay. So, for instance, uh, here for the, well, I can assume that my sources are independent, but I don't know the reliability. I can use the consistency information trade off approach or the learning approach with the uh, pure relaxation pure rule. So in summary, so we have seen that Dempster's rule is a well-justified combination rule, satisfying important properties, offering numerous approaches to various problems and whose complexity can be managed. But there exists alternative well-justified combination rules corresponding to other assumptions or requirements. And in practice, Dempster's rule is often effective. That's why it's both for news, I think. And its underlying assumptions are met. However, if there is some uncertainty about the validity of these assumptions, yeah, there are several means to uh, select an alternative rule and uh, end up this uncertainty. So in the following, I provide references with respect to the various parts of my uh, lecture here. So on the topic of the justification of Dempster's rule, you have a few references. Uh, around the decomposition by the Dempster rule, you have also some, some papers on this topic. For the computation, uh, Again, so this is a very important paper, by the way, from Wilson on this problem. Uh, so the approximation techniques that I explained, they, uh, they were since I don't know that proposed them. Yes, these two papers. Yeah. The summarization uh, technique is from the, this paper. On the conflict, there are many, many papers on the conflicts, but I selected a few ones uh, here. On the issue of the modeling the reliability of the sources. On the topic of the dependence, also, that is quite a huge report on this topic. And the problem of selecting a given rule, 
few references that I uh, used for the, for the last part of the talk. And I would like to end this with um, a little uh, part on the actual uh, implementation of the, the, of, the, of the most common combination rules in the, let's say, the most common languages. So here I highlighted a few libraries uh, for this. So I, uh, I have not tested them all, okay? Uh, I'm personally uh, mostly familiar with the MATLAB one, which you can find some in R, in Python, in C++, in Java, okay? Uh, yeah, so there is no uh, warrant. I don't, I don't know you say no warranty, no guarantee. It's more in research uh, libraries. But, and so what I would like to do in the, uh, I have some time left, I don't know. Yeah. So it's show you concretely with an example how, uh, because we used to have in the in this uh, school uh, uh, a lecture on uh, big function implementation. So I think we will talk about it uh, in an assembly, but uh, our colleague is not here anymore. So I'll just take a few minutes to, uh, to do it and show you how, how we can do it. So here, my, my example is the following. The goal is to compute the outer clustering approximation of the orthogonal sum of the two mass functions that I had in my example, okay? The faulty mac boot example. So I have actually two simple mass functions, M1 and M2. I want to combine by the orthogonal sum and then perform the outer clustering approximation. Okay. So to do that, we proceed in four steps. First, we need to input M1 and M2 into the system. And we will see uh, we use a particular format. Then we compute the conjunctive rule, conjunctive combination of M1 and M2 using the commonality based approach. Then we get the orthogonal sum of M1 and M2 by normalizing the conjunctive combination. And finally, we compute the uh, outer clustering approximation. Yeah. Okay. So what is the focused format? So it's a way to specify a mass function. So let M be a mass function defined on some set, um, some frame omega. Uh, let us assume here that M has R focal sets, okay, F1 to FR. So M can be represented by a pair, so uh, mass F here, where mass is a R dimensional column vector of masses. Okay, you see the mass given to the focal set one, etc., jusqu'à FR. And F is a binary matrix such that its general term here, Fij, equals one if omega j belongs to Fi and zero otherwise. So you see on my example, so my frame here is PCHO, okay, the, the new issue of the faulty MacBook. My first mass is this one, M1 0 0.9 to PC, 0 0.1 to the whole frame. So to specify input this mass, you get you have a vector, you store this stores the, the value of the the masses given to the focal sets, okay, so 0 0.9, 0 0.1 are here. And then I have this binary matrix here, yeah, which describes this focal set. So you see there is an order, so P, C, H, O, so here I put 1 to P, 1 to C, 0 to H, 0 to O, which corresponds to this focal set P, C. And then the, the second row here is 1, 1, 1, 1, it represents the whole frame, okay, P, C, H, O, 1, 1, 1, etc. Okay, so that's to, to specify this mass, I just give the, the mass value here, 0 0.9 and 0 0.1, and then I specify these two focal sets. And the same for the second mass function, which is here. So here I have a different focal set, CH, so that, that's why I put 0, 1, 1, so 0, 1, 1, 0, okay? Set, subset CH. That's clear? Yeah? So then, so I would like to compute the conjunctive combination of M1 and M2. And I will use the commonality uh, based approach to the combination. Okay. And as we have seen, the commonality function is specified with um, two to the power of the cardinality of omega numbers. And so it can be represented by a, a vector, which is in a Q here, whose element j stores Q of aj, with aj the subset of omega, such that omega i belongs to aj if the highest bit is the binary representation of aj minus one equals one. Complicated, but it's actually very simple. So you see, for instance, in the fourth position of the vector Q, I store the, the, the community of the subset omega one, omega two, because the uh, the binary representation of four, so four, four minus one, so three, is this vector here. Yeah? So zero, one, one, so zero, omega three, one, omega two, one, omega one. So that's why I put omega one, omega two here. 
let's say. Okay. So this, uh, this before we saw the focus set format, this we call the vector format. And you can use it also to represent mass beneath enclosability function. So for instance, this M1 here is the vector, column vector which stores in its element J the value of M1 to uh, open J. And this format is the one expected by the MATLAB function of the FMT2 box that performs the transformation from one function, function to, the, uh, to the other. Okay. And so if you want to compute the commonality function Q1 and Q2 uh, associated to M1 and M2, you first need to convert M1 and M2 from the focused format to the vector format. And for that, there is a function called M to BBM. So we recall that this mass one F1 was the focused representation of M1, so the vector of mass and the, the matrix of focus sets. And you give these two elements to the, this function and it returns the vector M1 here, which stores the, the whole mass. Okay. The same for M2. And then uh, we have a function called M2Q, which transforms the mass function M1 in, in the vector format into the commonality function associated to M1. Okay. So then it's very easy to compute the commonality function associated to the conjunctive combination, which is done by the pointwise product of the vector, vectors Q1 and Q2. And finally, when you want to get the, the mass function associated to the conjunctive combination, you need to transform the commonality function into a, a mass function. And for this, you see here, you put M to Q, so mass to commonality. Here we use commonality to mass, Q to M. Okay, so we get M, M12 denotes here this mass function. Okay. Then in the third step, we want to obtain the orthogonal sum, not the conjunctive combination. So for that, we will use a function called M to NM for normalized mass, which uh, given the mass function M returns the mass function M prime defined like this. So you see we divide by the mass given to the empty set. So that's what we call the normalization. So, so the vector we had obtained here, we pass it to this function M to NM, and it gives us the uh, this, uh, M to M12 here, which is this orthogonal sum. And the last step is when we want to compute the outer clustering approximation. And for that, we can use a function called Appier. And uh, this function expect, expects uh, M to be provided in the focus set format. So we now need to pass from the vector format to the focus set format. And from that, there be, for that, there is a function called BBM to M. Okay, so the orthogonal sum that we had in the, orth in the vector format, we transform it to the focus set format. So that's the vector of mass and the binary matrix of the focus sets. And then we can pass this uh, the sum in the focus set format to the function uh, up here, here, which returns the outer approximation of the orthogonal sum in the, form, in the focus set format again. And that's what we get at the end. So if we perform the orthogonal sum of M1 and M2, and then we do the uh, outer clustering approximation for k equals 2, we get this result here. So if you have followed what I've explained so far, it means that we allocate the mass 0 0.72 to the subset containing only, among, only the element C and 0 0.28 to the whole frame. And this is the full program that I uh, showed you. So you can just take this and run it uh, on your uh, MATLAB or Octave or whatever. It's basic illustration of implementing uh, combination of beautiful. 